Good evening. Thank you so much for coming here to Trinity Cathedral. We're very excited about uh, the opportunity to host this book talk on such a fascinating topic. Um, just a quick reminder, we are live streaming. Um, so by remaining here, you agree that the back of your head can be seen by whoever's on our live stream. Um, and that's really all that's gonna be shown. Um, also, I'd ask that you turn off your cell phones um, if you could take care of that so we don't have buzzing or ringing in the middle of the talk. Uh, there will be a book signing afterwards. And um, so if you will wait until Sarah makes her way all the way out of the cathedral before standing up, there are books for sale and the book signing will still be in the cathedral. It's just another room off to the left there. We'll, we'll get you there when you need it. Um, and I think that's all I need to announce. Steve? Hello, my name is Steve Leahy. I'm a priest associate at St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in Lincoln and a professor of religious studies at the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Classics and Religious Studies Department, both of those organizations, in addition to the UNO Religious Studies Program and Trinity Cathedral, have agreed to sponsor Sarah's visit today. Um, I, my introduction to you will be fairly short, mostly because I expect most of you are regular listeners to Sarah. Sarah began her public radio career in, at the, in Nebraska Public Radio, um, and that is, institution is well represented here today. I'm very glad to have you folks here. Um, she then moved on to, to Iowa and then Atlanta, and then uh, Virginia, where she has remained a voice of reason, responsibility, and understanding at a time when such voices are few and far between. And so I am very happy that she has agreed to come here and speak about a topic that will only increase in importance over the coming months. So please welcome Sarah McCammon. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but Steve, AKA Father Leahy, has also had a career in ministry and was, I think you baptized my oldest, didn't you? Yeah, you baptized my oldest son in uh, 20, 2007, my little Lincoln baby, and then I went to Iowa and had one there, and now they're teenagers, so that's how much time has gone by since I was here in Nebraska. But it's so good to see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this book is, is the product of a lot of discomfort between my personal and professional life uh, sort of unexpectedly in, intersecting with each other. I probably made a mistake in 2016, maybe, when I agreed to give an interview to a, a podcast um, about public media that was hosted by a friend of mine named Adam Ragusia. He is now a YouTuber. I think he, he had a... He had a pizza recipe that went viral, and he gave up journalism and became a YouTuber. So uh, <laughs> that's maybe, uh, maybe the next career path for me. But Adam, at, it, back in 2016, when I was covering the Trump campaign, asked me if I would talk to him for his podcast about what it was like to cover the Trump campaign as somebody with an evangelical background. Evangelicals were such a big part of the story, and I and I think every other national journalist that was covering the 2016 campaign was doing all these stories about um, you know, the important white evangelical base in the Republican Party and what evangelical leaders and voters were making of Donald Trump. And the question that sort of hung over that uh, campaign was would evangelicals continue to support someone like Trump who seemed to be so antithetical to everything uh, many evangelicals said they stood for. I. Um, I had had my own, you know, mostly until that I did that interview, pretty quiet uh, separation from my own evangelical history. I had struggled with a lot of aspects of it, including the way that my church talked about my gay grandfather, who is a central part of this book, um, and a lot of other issues, but I mostly processed those privately. I remember in my, my first public radio job here in Nebraska, I did a piece about these... Um, 
mammoth fossils that were discovered in western Nebraska by a graduate student in, I think, the 60s or 70s had been in storage at UNL for a long time and were being moved back out to western Nebraska to be displayed. And maybe Nancy remembers the story. Maybe not. It's OK if you don't. But um, the story was, a, it was really cool. It was like this nerdy science story that public radio people live for. These, these two mammoths had been fossilized together with their tusks like twisted together because they were two males who were fighting over a female. And I had this great sound bite from a, you know, an older professor who was like, it's actually the old story. They're fighting over sex. You know? So I was like, yes, sex on the public radio. I love it. Um, but as I was writing the story, you know, one of the things that I had to address was how old these fossils were. And the paleontologist said they were like 20,000 years old, which isn't really that old. But when you were taught that the Earth is six to 10,000 years old, <laughs> 20,000 was a lot. And I, you know, by that point, I was about 23, 24. I had pretty much come to terms with the idea that evolution was real and that, you know, scientists hadn't made it up so that they could sin, like I was told in, in my Christian school. Um, but it was really weird to write that line, you know, 20,000 years ago in a script because it felt like this moment where I just realized how much I had evolved and shifted. And it was this kind of funny moment of discomfort. But those didn't happen that much. You know, in many ways, I became a journalist because I wanted to get away from ideology. I wanted to move toward the questions as opposed to the answers. But in 2016, after I gave this interview to my friend Adam and I talked about some of the themes I was seeing and hearing you know, as a journalist, but someone who remembered what it was like to be a teenager, an evangelical teenager in the 1990s, growing up in purity culture, being told that character mattered and that our president needed to have uh, exemplary moral behavior and then to watch the 2016 campaign unfold. Um, I, talked to, I sort of reflected on that and talked about what I was seeing and hearing. And it seemed like after that, every, all anyone wanted to know when I would visit stations or talk to friends is, how do you make sense of this moment as somebody who is both a national political journalist and grew up in the evangelical world? How do you explain it? And um, so I found myself answering that question a lot. At, and at, at a certain point, I, had I got really tired of answering it. And I just have this one memory of uh, doing a station visit. I actually visited my hometown station in Kansas City. And I think I was having a particularly just sort of stressful day. Maybe it was just being back home. And somebody asked me that question. At, and at the end of um, this particular gathering, I had to go lock myself in a studio and just cry because I just felt like I was so tired of talking about my personal history and the way it was intersecting with this really tense political moment. So um, I decided to just write a whole book about that, <laughs> as one does. You know, I, I believe in leaning into discomfort, and I, I spent several years thinking about that. And uh, this book is really the product of, of several years of reflection on both my childhood and the 2016 campaign cycle and where we are today, and also of a lot of conversations I've had with other people from the evangelical world who are thinking hard about what that means. So I want to start with a reading um, about that. I have two readings, and then I'll take some questions. I've been, this is my fifth event this weekend. I've been talking a lot, and I'm just as happy to let all, all of you ask questions. But um, this, this passage sort of explains the genesis of this book. I first heard the term exvangelical while working on a story for NPR in 2016 about the dilemma Trump posed for so many white evangelical women. It was right before the election, soon after the now infamous Access Hollywood video that had surfaced in which she was recorded bragging about grabbing women by the, and since we're streaming, I just won't say it, when that scandal broke, I was taking a day off to hike and rest after a reporting trip in Nevada and was napping in my hotel room when my editor called. I spent the next several hours calling sources, particularly conservative Christian leaders, trying to assess the fallout and talking with editors about how exactly to describe this event on the radio. Could we say the word on NPR? <laughs> if not, how could we convey what was happening here? The verdict, we could, within reason, with a language warning. This was not a discussion I'd ever had in a journalism class. 
A few weeks later, as the dust settled and evangelical leaders continued to rally around him in the days before the election, Christian singer-songwriter Nicole Nordeman told NPR in an interview, I find it sickening that these, men, that these men can face their congregations and their families and their college campuses and feel okay with trusting Donald Trump with their voice and their vote and their country and still somehow explain it away through the lens of the teachings of Christ. It boggles my mind. Nordeman said she'd been hearing the term ex-evangelical, quote, thrown around quite a bit, just the sense that we are trying to find new language to define us as followers of Christ because this old term has felt unbelievably compromised by this election and by some of the old guard in evangelical leadership. In the years that followed, I'd heard a similar disillusionment from several women raised in the evangelical world, feelings of shock and anger that the same leaders who ordered us to remain sexually pure until marriage and who condemned Bill Clinton's moral failings in the 1990s would not only tolerate but embrace and promote Trump. For Promise and Low, it was impossible to ignore the difference between how her community responded to Trump's transgressions and her own. She'd been raised in evangelical purity culture, married at 18 with little knowledge of herself or serious relationships into what she describes as a toxic relationship. She divorced a year later, something she said simply wasn't done in her family. That was a big deal. Everyone at my parents' church was freaking out about it, she said. Suddenly, she felt out of place at church, shunned. So it was hard to watch several years later, she told me, as that same community embraced Trump, despite, despite his own litany of transgressions, including not only divorces, but alleged affairs, racist and misogynistic attacks on his opponents, mocking a disabled reporter, even his assertion that he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and not lose supporters. Inlow found all of it distasteful, inconsistent with the values she'd been taught, and disorienting. I would ask people around me, how is that, that not outrageous to you? Even as a Christian, how can you see that and, think, and not think, oh, Jesus, Jesus would probably not be cool with that? And they all defended it. So Promise Inlow is just one of many people I have interviewed for this book, um, from evangelical backgrounds who over the last eight years or so have been publicly reassessing what that means to them. And Trump is not the only reason. Trump has been a catalyst for a lot of conversations about what it means to be evangelical, what it means to be Christian. And this is happening at a time when white Christianity is declining across the board in the US, not just in the evangelical world, but evangelicalism is particularly large and particularly politically influential because evangelicals vote in outsized numbers and are a more unified voting bloc than just about, than certainly any voting bloc of that size. The second reading that I wanted to share with you is just sort of paints a picture of growing up in the evangelical world as a child and kind of the stakes that were presented to me and to many others for getting it right, getting your theology right. It's difficult to save a world you're taught to fear and are carefully sheltered from. In my early years, my world revolved around our church, on a sprawling campus, a short drive over the Kansas state line into the suburbs, and the K-12 school I began attending at age five, which met in classrooms inside red brick buildings of a small fundamentalist Bible church in Kansas City, Missouri. Aside from my father's family, I didn't know anyone who didn't know Jesus. Our mission field, as we put it, was limited, so every sustained interaction with a potential non-believer felt a little guilty, like a shirked obligation, if I stayed silent. One of those rare opportunities presented itself when I was about eight years old, as my mother correctly determined that I needed to spend several Saturday mornings at what can only be described as remedial skating lessons. At least once a year, my school rented out a rink for a party where we skated to praise and worship songs. Some of the girls would show up with their own beautiful skates from home in pink or white leather and seemingly fly around the rink. And I and my rented brown skates would cling to the metal bar, scooting a few steps at a time around the circle and often falling. So my mom found a class where an instructor patiently showed us how to maneuver our skates to slow down and speed up and how to use toe stoppers to break. I didn't know any of the other kids, but I understood that most of them went to public school. 
There was one girl about my age that I especially liked. She was friendly and chatty and almost as awkward in the rink. We'd stumble through our lessons together, then talk while we unlaced our skates and put on our sneakers to go home. One week, an unwelcome thought entered my mind. What if God wants me to witness to her? My stomach tightened. What if I'm the only person in her life who can tell her? What if she dies without Jesus because of me? I couldn't shake the sense of obligation. The last week of class came, and all I could think about was what to say to her. As we took off our skates and put on our shoes for the last time, I couldn't bring myself to start with the opening line we'd heard in so many sermons, if you died tonight, do you know where you would go? It felt like a little bit much for skate land. We picked up our jackets and I followed her outside. We waited by the front door, watching the car line as each parent pulled up. Any moment, my parents would arrive, whisking me home to clean my bedroom before spending a lazy Saturday afternoon playing in the backyard. I'd probably never see her again. Eternity hung in the balance with seconds to spare. My heart pounded. Now, this is your last chance. Um, I said, do you go to church? Yeah, sometimes, she said. Anyway, my dad's here. And that was that. No big sign from God, no literal come to Jesus moment. Only me, my skates, and my awkward gesture toward heaven. I wouldn't try to make another one for a long time. And I share that because I think one of the toughest parts about growing up evangelical is, for a lot of us, this huge pressure you feel, not only to get it right, but to, to quote unquote, get it right for other people, make other people think the way that you do. And you know, that's sort of the word, the root of the word evangelical is related to the word e evangelism. And with that comes, you know, there's this very comforting sense of certainty of having all the answers, except unless you don't feel like you have all the answers, and then you're, you're being asked to try to tell the world about something that seems actually very, these are big questions that everybody struggles with. And the other piece of it is that for, for so much of the evangelical world, there is increasingly a political project, that, and that is you know, part of what this book is about, is the way that an entire world, an entire infrastructure of books, magazines, TV shows, radio shows that were sort of built up around the evangelical world and particularly around evangelical kids of my generation created this kind of parallel universe of ideas that can be very difficult to penetrate. So um, one of the things that the book talks about is, is some really fascinating research that scholars at the University of Connecticut and elsewhere have been doing about the... Um, just the, unfortunately, the, the uptake of misinformation in many evangelical circles. And, and I would argue, and I think others have argued, that having a, creating sort of an intellectual infrastructure around you, an, an intellectual bubble that is impenetrable by science and facts, creates, it lays the groundwork for sometimes some very dangerous ideologies. So, um, this isn't, you know, I want to be clear, this book is not anti religion, it's not even anti-evangelicalism, but I wanted to try to paint a really granular picture of what it was like for me and for many others of my generation to grow up in this world that has become so influential and which, um, you know, at a moment now when we're seeing incredible influence of the evangelical movement and, and at the same time really significant decline. And I think those two trends explain a lot of, um, a lot of the tension we're seeing today, quite frankly. Um, we're seeing a movement that used to be very powerful, that used to dominate, uh, in many ways in decline. And I think scholars like Robbie Jones of the Public Religion Research Institute, who does a lot of really excellent research on this, have argued that uh, it's no accident that we're seeing sort of a doubling down and a, and a deepening polarization at this moment. The country is changing in some big ways, and there is frankly a lot of you know, resistance to that uh, among many in the religious right. So, with that, I am happy to take any questions um, that you might have. And I'm going to go ahead and switch. I think we're going to have a microphone. OK. Um, I'm fine standing up here to talk, but I want to come down and talk to you here. So I'm going to go ahead and put on a mic, and they're going to pass a mic around. OK. One moment. Mm.
So I know that our acoustics here are great, and some folks know that their voices can carry through the acoustics, but you can't carry into the live stream. So I will hand you the microphone. Is this on? Can, can everybody hear me still? No? Hello, hello? OK. I could go back to the pulpit, but honestly, it's a little weird for me being in a pulpit. <laughs> I was told growing up that you weren't supposed to do that yeah, if you we were a girl. Like What's that? We like you in the pulpit. Yeah, it's fine. But this is, this is good. This is good. Thank you very much for coming. A two-part question. Did you interview Michael Cohen for the book, and did you read his book? Um, no and no. <laughs> no. I, I, I know who he is, but I... The book is really about like growing up in the evangelical world and, and the, the evangelical mindset. There was a part in the book where when he and Trump discussed running in 2015, they decided that they'd need the evangelicals. They invited all the big names that they knew into the tower. They, uh, Trump said what I guess he thought they wanted to hear. Uh, they asked if they could bless him. By the way, in the book, there are pictures of this. This all happened. Um, and so uh, after they left, they went back into, he and Trump went back into the office. And Trump's comment was, uh, I'll have to clean this up a little for the church. Do you, do you believe uh, that BS? And do you, can you believe that they believe that BS? That's the extent of his, uh, you know, his beliefs. Okay, I'm familiar with the story that you're talking about. I didn't, I didn't read the book. There's so many books. But um, I think it's very clear from a lot of reporting that Trump very intentionally courted the evangelical vote. He understood the importance of it in the Republican base and surrounded himself with evangelical advisors from a, from a broad swath of American evangelicalism. So um, Many of you are probably familiar with this, but I mean, evangel the evangelical umbrella is massive. We're talking about, at one time, close to one in four Americans were white evangelicals, and if you include people of color, that's still true. Um, today, it's more like 14%, but within that umbrella, you have, you have non-denominational churches, you have the Southern Baptist Convention, um, which is the largest organized denomination, although it's, it's losing numbers very, very quickly. Um, and then you have the charismatic and Pentecostal movement, which is very experiential, emotional, expressive. Um, people like Paula White would be associated with that. And Trump surrounded himself with a, a, a wide swath, you know, Baptist leaders, charismatic leaders, um, people from the old evangelical um, political machine, like Ralph Reed and Gary Bauer and others, and did, th and did that quite strategically and tailored his messaging to evangelicals. So when you hear things like, um, you know, when he holds up the Bible and says, we're going to bring the Bible back and we're going to bring Christianity back. Even when he says, make America great again, in many ways, he's arguably pointing back to a time when white Christianity was dominant in the culture to a much larger degree than it is today. Um, so, I mean, it, it seems like it was a very strategic choice and it was a very effective one. And, you know, I was there and I write about this in the book in June of 2016 when about a thousand evangelical leaders, so pastors, ministry leaders, political activists and others from all over the country from, again, a, a wide array of evangelical subgroups all came to New York and, and met with Trump in a big ballroom. I was one of, I think, two reporters that managed to get in. Um, and that, on that day, he uh, talked about Get rid of, getting rid of the Johnson Amendment, which is sort of the restrictions on what churches can say politically, what pastors can say politically. He didn't do it, but he talked about it. And um, he also reiterated his pledge to release a list of conservative just judges for potential Supreme Court nominees. Um, he had released one list, and then he expanded the list, and of course, ultimately wound up choosing three Supreme Court justices who were instrumental in overturning Roe v. Wade. So. I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, so you come at this point in your life from an Episcopal background, which is what we all are, and you're kind of preaching to the choir here tonight. I'm, you know, I'm, I struggle with what we are called to do, just as 
Episcopalians that live in Omaha, Nebraska. It's very, it just is, it was, it's just as hard to tap somebody on the shoulder and strike up a conversation about this as it was for you to, to ask your friend if she knew what was gonna happen to her if she died tonight. I mean, do you have suggestions for how we might tackle this? Because I'm troubled by it. Well, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I just, I wanted to help people understand, as I said, on a really sort of granular level, what it's like inside of the evangelical world. And, and with the caveat that, again, it's a huge movement that encompasses many subgroups, and not everyone thinks the same. Not everyone is a young earth creationist, for example. But I think, you know, as I was saying a moment ago, I think it's, for me, it's not that hard to understand if you're taught that scientists are sinning and they're making up evolution because they want to sin and they want to deny God. It's not, it's not a hard, it's not a difficult move then to say, well, they must be lying about climate change. They must be lying about vaccines. Um, you know, secular institutions and authorities are, are not to be trusted. And, and look, I'm a journalist. I believe in healthy skepticism. But at the same time, if we don't have sort of a common set of facts and understandings, it's very hard to move, move forward together as a democratic society. And so I'm not sure how you solve it. I, I don't, you know, I'm a journalist. I don't usually have a lot of answers, just a lot of questions. But, I, but one of the things I really hope the book will accomplish for people on the outside is to understand, you know, again, there's a whole sort of intellectual infrastructure out there that for many people, it's, it's possible to be so embedded in that there isn't a lot on the outside. And that's increasingly true in many ways today. I mean, we all exist to a certain extent thanks to the internet and algorithms inside our own intellectual silos. And um, if, if the one that you're siloed in is missing some key pieces of information, it can be very hard to get outside of that. And then I, you know, I talk a lot about the fear of hell and the fear of wrong theology, the fear of angering God, because that is so embedded in, in the culture and in, it, and in the minds of particularly the, those of us who were raised in it. That I think, I hope it will at least foster some empathy for, you know, I mean, people so often ask me how evangelicals think and how, how I make sense of, of, of where we are now. And I, I usually point to those things. Um, what you do with that information is up to you. <laughs> but I, I hope it's at least helpful in, in providing some insight. Hi, Sarah. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, two questions. Um, I was a huge fan, am a huge fan of C-SPAN, and Brian Lamb's show, Book Notes, back before he retired, and one of the questions he would always ask writers is, so I have two questions, actually. One is um, inspired by him, and that is, what was your process of writing the book? My second question is, um, what is the relationship you have with your family like today? I'll answer the second one first and then the first one, because the first one's easier and I want to get the second one out of the way. Um, the, I, I mean, the, the answer depends on the person. I have, uh, I'm, I have relationships with all of my family. I'm not estranged from anyone. I let everyone know I was doing this and um, got, got their input if they were talked about in it. Um, and, and overall, I think things are in a pretty good place. Uh, the process of writing the book was, uh, it was helpful for me in a lot of ways in clarifying some things and working through some things. And I think some of the conversations that, it, that ensued from that were actually difficult but productive conversations. So um, that's the second question. The first one about the writing process. I, I had been thinking, you know, really since, since 2016, since I heard this word exvangelical, I just zeroed in on it because I thought, wow, that really kind of says a lot in one word. It, it describes, um, you know, being part of something and then leaving it, being part of a subculture and then not identifying with it. And I think there's a word for it now because it is, there is sort of a universality about the experience among people I've talked to. There are a lot of um, sometimes sources of cognitive dissonance that crop up as you get older. Um, that sort of forced this unpacking and rethinking. And then, again, for a lot of people, the last eight years when questions about evangelicalism and what it is and what it means have been so central to so many political, public conversations, um, 
you know, there's been kind of an escalation of those conversations. So I've been paying attention to all of that, to social media spaces and podcasts and, you know, Facebook groups and hashtags and all this, um, where these conversations were going on, the kinds of conversations that, that are difficult to have in church. Like, for me, when I was sort of um, experimenting with different churches, you know, I would sometimes feel like I couldn't talk to people at the church about the fact that I was unsure about certain things because that's, you know, that's, that's not always encouraged. It depends on the church. Um, so I, I started thinking about this for the last several years. I actually just started kind of journaling um, the year after the campaign in 2017, uh, just really reflecting on my evangelical childhood in a deeper way and trying to remember what were the things that, what were those little tension points and, and the points where things started to fracture for me. Um, and then I, the last couple of years before I actually wrote the book, you know, I started putting together a book proposal and it was really, it was really January 6th, 2021. Um, when I saw all of the Christian nationalist language that seemed to propel the insurrection for a lot of people that I decided that I, I had been thinking about what I wanted to say and I felt like I had something I wanted to say, you know. Um, I, as a journalist, I was cautious about not overstepping and connecting dots or, or sort of going out, speaking out of school, but I felt like when people walked into the Capitol toward the Capitol um, on January 6th with signs that said Jesus saves and carrying crosses and pictures of Jesus. It was kind of like, well, I don't have to connect the dots. They've been connected already. Um, so at that point, I started seriously writing a book proposal, and I pulled together some pieces of, of my own journals. I started doing interviews with people that I was meeting online and a couple of people I knew in real life and just started um, putting together uh, a few chapters and that grew into more chapters and then I spent mostly 2022 writing the book um, and that required a lot of just really structured organization because um, I have a day job <laughs> and so usually I would t I, I had um, a deadline every three weeks for a chapter I spent usually Friday through Monday just writing and, and finishing up my research. I take off a Friday and a Monday and do like four days of just intense writing. Um, edit with my editor the chapter the following Wednesday and then start again. So um, it was actually really fun. Like it's a lot of work, but it was really fun to spend time with one subject, you know, for three weeks because the, the book is organized thematically. So, um, you know, as a journalist, you spend, you know, maybe a week on a story, but sometimes a day, so. Um, and then the last year was just revisions, lots of revisions. Hey, Sarah, thanks for being here today. Um, is there, I know you've talked about how broad uh, the evangelical side of things is, and um, so this might be hard to answer, but do you sense that there's much within the evangelicals um, reflection on the decline in membership where there re any reaction or adapting to it? I mean, there's obviously decline in mainline churches too, right. but I'm just wondering if, if uh, the people that are leaving, if it's sort of sinking in in any kind of way of addressing that or if it's just seen as sort of a necessary thing. I've seen a variety of reactions. Um, in, the, in the book, I talk about the fact that um, Russell Moore, who is the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today and uh, was a, a high-ranking leader in the Southern Baptist Convention, but, but left the Southern Baptist Convention for a variety of reasons, although he's very much still an evangelical. Um, he's written, I think, very thoughtfully about it and has has talked about the fact that church leaders should listen to especially the younger people who are leaving and, and listen to the reasons why. Um, I've seen reactions from others, which I also talk about in the book, that are uh, less warm. <laughs> uh, you know, pastors who've accused people of um, deconstructing, which is kind of the internet parlance for, for rethinking one's faith, um, because they want to sin or they think it's cool or any variety of uh, other reasons and um, you know I, I'm not surprised I mean I, that there would be pushback but I think uh, at the same time as you say it's it's not 
this is not confined to evangelicalism. I chose to write about evangelicalism because it is, as I mentioned, um, it has such an outsized influence on politics, and, and it's the world that I know. But it's, it's happening across the board for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, the data that I've seen, there's, there's more and more data all the time about why, and people who, who leave their churches, and this is across the board, um, one of the biggest reasons they cite, and it's, it, it tends to be younger people, uh, disproportionately, is the way that churches treat LGBTQ people. So I think that's something that, um, I'm sure that's something that pastors are aware of, and, and I think they respond to it in a variety of ways. I've also seen new churches pop up that, in fact, one that I profile in the book, that have been intentional about trying to be open to people who are sort of just trying to figure it out. And um, so it's fascinating. I mean, American Christianity is going through some huge shifts right now, and I, I don't know where it all lands, but it's very interesting to me. Congratulations on the book and on the reception of the book. Thank you. I, I'm, as somebody who works for a organization with really high ethical standards, and you're representative of the, of the organization, at what point do you let them know that you're that you let NPR know that you're working on a book, and is what's that conversation like once the content's been developed, and uh, is there a vetting process as a, as a journalist with your employer? Yeah, um, I at NPR we have to um, run everything past our ethics team, and so I uh, I let them know when I was that I was working on a book proposal and told them a little bit about the concept, and then. When I had a contract, I let them know the revised proposal. Um, and you know, one thing I've tried to be very careful to do with this book is um, you won't find me telling anybody who to vote for or what to believe. Um, I describe my life and the lives of other people, <laughs> and um, try to stick pretty close to that because I am a journalist. And, and you know, I think, I mean, it's a good question and it's one that I thought hard about exactly how to approach it. Um, but I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing, um, you know, an evolution in sort of how, how journalists, I don't know if it's an evolution. I mean, I, I'm actually not the first. Tim Alberta incorporated some of his own evangelical experiences in, into his book. Um, Tim Egan, about 15 years ago, or not even 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, wrote a book about um, his wrestling with his Catholic faith. So um, it's, it's a little challenging as a journalist to think about exactly how to conceptualize and frame, but uh, I, again, you won't, you won't catch me telling you who to vote for. And it's not, you know, again, I, I'm careful to say this, my book is not about, it's not anti-religion. In fact, I think it's very friendly to religion and spirituality. And, um, and it's not partisan. It's just about a phenomenon that I have particularly close experience with. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the abortion issue and how that's been um, kind of a driver of politics in evangelical circles or a way to get the evangelical vote, I guess, if I understand correctly for the last five decades, and then if you have any insight to Trump's recent prevarications on the topic. Right, so white evangelicals express in polls the most opposition to abortion of any major religious group, even more than Roman Catholics who I think, you know, whose church officially, church teaching is officially opposed to abortion. Um, it, there's a long history there. Uh, Randall Balmer wrote, a, I think, a very, one of the more definitive histories of how that came to be. But the short version is um, that you know, prior to basically the 1970s, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, for example, had, um, you know, generally, their position was generally opposed to abortion, but not in all cases. It was a little bit looser, the, the framing of that opposition, um, it allowed for like a lot of exceptions and some discretion. But um, Balmer and other historians have argued that uh, Jerry Falwell Sr. and um, Ted Weirich and other leaders of the moral majority and the Christian coalition came together around the late 70s, early 80s and, and began to mobilize white evangelical voters um, 
toward the Republican Party, toward conservative politics, and around opposition to abortion. I, prior to that, it had been seen largely as a Catholic issue, as I understand it. Um, but this was happening at a time when uh, there was growing concern among many conservative white Christians about, uh, about secularization, about changing roles of women, and also about integration. Um, one of the things that Balmer has, has argued is that um, there's a direct line between the integration of, of public schools and IRS requirements that in order to obtain or maintain nonprofit stat tax status, uh, schools had to integrate. Um, there was a fight between Bob Jones University and the IRS over this that uh, he argues you know, precipitated this alignment between the Christian right and, um, and the Republican Party. So, you know, abortion has been the, the most high profile, probably the most salient issue for that group. Trump was obviously aware of that. You know, he promised when he ran in 2016 that he would, that if he was elected, Roe would be overturned, that he would name uh, Supreme Court justices who opposed abortion, and obviously he did that, and that happened. Um, I think what we're seeing now is a recognition on the part of uh, many Republicans that there appears to be a backlash to some of the policies that have taken effect as a result of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, you know, we've now seen uh, cases in Texas and other states where women in, in emergency medical situations have been denied abortions, despite state laws that say that there are medical exceptions. But um, as, you, as you may know, for many doctors, they say that the wording of these laws is just unclear and they're afraid of being sued or losing their licenses or worse. Um, so we've seen, and we've seen the impact of, um, you know, there was that very high profile case in, in Ohio, that tragic case where a, a 10 year old victim of sexual assault had to travel out of state for an abortion after the Dobbs decision. Um, you know, I went to Ohio last year when abortion was on the ballot and, and that was something I heard about. You know, I think many people, including independent and Republican voters who may generally be opposed to abortion, feel that many of these policies have gone too far. So uh, Republicans, of course, recognize that. They've seen in the last two elections, voters appear to signal that sort of backlash. And I think that is pretty clearly why we see Trump's messaging being kind of all over the place. Um, there is an effort to appeal to the swing voters in the middle while also placating the party base. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have any opinions from your perspective, and it's okay if you don't, about um, the huge rise of Mormonism in the country and um, how maybe the internet and has influenced a huge rise in Mormonism and the politics they plan to. Is there a huge, is there a huge rise in Mormonism? I, I haven't seen that data. Um, I, would have to, I would have to look at the data. I know that in the uh, deconstruction, I don't want to say community, but um, the hashtag deconstruction, the label deconstruction that, that so many uh, ex-evangelicals have applied to their spiritual journey, is, I've also seen that used in, in ex-Mormon spaces, but I don't, I don't know the numbers, so I'm sorry. It is, I do think, I will, the only thing I'll say about Mormons is that it is interesting that they, um, Mormons are another, of course, like conservative group that is largely white, um, but the politics are a bit different. Um, Mormon support for, for Trump, for example, has been much softer than evangelical support. I'm not sure why, but it's interesting. Hi. Did you find in your interviewing, as you were working through your book, that in trying to square the evangelical teachings and the negativity, the, the sinful ways that particularly Donald Trump acted, was it a one issue vote? Did you, did you have people say that, that they were willing to vote for that because Donald Trump was going to over, try to overturn Roe, Roe v. Wade. Were there those who, who said, nope, that's the most important thing. I'm willing to let everything else go just because I only want that. I don't think it was just that issue. I mean, I, 
it's been eight years now. <laughs> I don't recall anyone specifically saying it's just that issue. I, rem I but I did hear a, a lot about um, abortion and then the Supreme Court. I would, I would ask people a lot, this, essentially this question, and they would say, well, I'm really concerned about the Supreme Court, which is often um, code for abortion or primarily abortion, but other things too. Um, you know, I've, I've asked some version of that question of so many people over the years, and I think the, the answers that are fresher in my mind are from this election cycle when I was in Iowa for the caucuses and talking to people. And, you know, I would hear things like, um, well, one, one state lawmaker in Iowa, a Republican state lawmaker who also is an evangelical pastor, uh, said that he, he doesn't like, well, he, he realizes Trump has kind of a brash persona, and, it, and he says things that he wouldn't say, but um, he said, you know, in this political arena, we need a fighter. We need a fighter for our values. And I hear things like that a lot, and I see those kinds of statements publicly from evangelical leaders. There's a real sense that um, the culture is in decline, that the country is in decline, and that the reason for it is the erosion of uh, Christian dominance, I think, for lack of a better word. Um, and so, I think that many, many evangelicals see Trump as someone who will sort of stem the tide of cultural decline, who will stand up and fight for their values. And he says it explicitly. You know, he says, like I said, we're going to bring Christianity back. The country is still more than 60% Christian, but he says, we're going to bring Christianity back. I'm going to bring the Bible back. I'm going to fight for you. Christianity is under siege. That's, that's what he said um, a couple of weeks ago when he was selling the God Bless the USA Bible. And I think. For people who see the country changing, it's more diverse, it's more secular, women have um, rights and roles that women didn't have decades ago, I think for some segment of that population, that message resonates. Um, I, hi. Hi, I'm the live streamer. <laughs> No, it's fine. I can see you in my little plant. cave. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really resonate with some of your story. I, I was not raised evangelical, but I was raised Roman Catholic. And um, what you've talked about a lot in terms of the points of tension and dissonance and coming out of a very strict religious background into not leaving Christianity, but... Um, but coming to terms with and, and breaking away from that origin, I guess. And so I'm really curious about what your journey was like um, leaving the evangelical church but not leaving Christianity. Yeah, um, it, was, it was hard, it was scary. Um, I, I think the biggest reason, and I, I sort of go into this in, in different places throughout the book is I just wanted to include people that I didn't feel I could include in the community that I had been in, including my grandfather. You know, I, um, his story is sort of an arc for the whole book, and, you know, the short version is that he was one of very few people I knew who was not religious at all, and, and that was a real, really big concern for us. We, you know, we felt we had to try to save him, persuade him to see the world as we did. And, um, you know, my, my grandmother passed away pretty young, and he came out as gay right after that, like within a couple of years. And so, um, you know, it set up a really interesting sort of tension in, in, my, in my world because, um, you know, that was, I was going to churches where, where anti-gay theology was being preached from the pulpit, and my own grandfather was gay and in a committed partnership, and so um, I had to wrestle with what to think about that, you know, over many years. And, uh, but I ultimately came to feel that I wanted to include him, and I wanted to include my non-Christian friends, and I wanted to accept them, and I, I didn't want to try to tell them what to think, you know, I just became very uncomfortable with that. Um, and so for me, uh, exploring the Episcopal tradition was was helpful. It was. It gave me a connection to, um, you know, a long, a long tradition of, of faith, um, but in an environment where I felt more free to to ask questions and to to um, include people I wanted to include. And 
I don't mean to paint all evangelical churches with a broad brush. I think they're all dealing with these questions in different ways, and, and it's interesting too, particularly on the LGBTQ issue, to look at the data. Younger evangelicals are much more accepting of LG, LGBTQ people and much more inclusive. Um, so that's another, just another shift that's happening um, in the evangelical church as well. I wonder, you mentioned that you especially love to ask questions. Um, I wonder after writing this book and spending the time telling this story, how it has changed you as a journalist, how it has shifted maybe some questions that you're interested in pursuing that maybe you hadn't pursued in the past? Um, I'm not sure if this will directly affect my, my journalism for NPR, but I'm, I'm really interested in kind of where people go as the country becomes more secular and people are less tied to religious institutions. I'm, I'm really curious about what that leads to, for good or bad. Um, you know, the, the data that I've seen about religious nuns, you know, NES, um, people who don't affiliate with any tradition, suggests that a lot of people still have retain a sense of spirituality or maybe a belief in God, but don't want to be connected to institutions. And I think, um, there are a bunch of reasons for that, and, and you know, I'm not going to weigh in on whether that's good or bad, but I think I can imagine both good and bad uh, consequences or results from that. Um, you know, one of the things that religious communities have done really well in some cases is provide community and provide resources when people are in need. You know, I mean, I grew up with whenever somebody was sick or had a baby, you know, you'd take over the casserole and you help babysit. And all of that stuff is really beautiful. It's a really beautiful aspect of religion. Uh, I mean, of course, not everybody's included and that's the challenge. And so, I mean, in some, in some religious spaces. Um, so I, I sort of flick at this in the book. You know, I talk to people, because some people in the book end up not religious at all. And some people end up in other traditions and, so, and some are just not sure what they want to do. Um, but I did ask people sort of like, well, where are you finding that community if you're not still in a church? And the answers vary. And for some people, it's sort of this idea of chosen family. And for some people, it's activities or hobbies they're a part of. But I really, I do wonder, like, can your, can your yoga class replace, like, the ladies with the casseroles? And, sorry that they usually were ladies. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't have an answer to that question, but it, I, but I'm, I'm curious about it, both on kind of like the community level and societal level and on like the individual level. What, it, where, what does a person do with their need for spiritual direction if they, if they feel that need? I'm coming. Thanks. It's great to hear you talk about this book and your journey. And I've, I've been able to um, listen to you read the first few chapters. So that's been really exciting, but I'm not done yet. I had a question about um, sort of the, the money or financial part of churches and people who are sort of the prosperity um, sort of idea of God looking favorably on folks and thinking about, uh, so I hope this data is right. Um, Right now we have pretty extreme economic inequality close to the Gilded Age. Some people will call this a new Gilded Age. And so I'm trying to sort out in my own mind how much um, the tie with the Republican Party and evangelical churches is also perhaps tied to sort of protecting financial interests but not talking about it that way. And I could be totally wrong, but I wondered if there was any element of that. And that might be in the later chapters, so I might be wrong. Yeah, I didn't get into the money very much, and maybe I should have, but, there, but other people have done really good work on that already. Um, like, uh, there's a book by, I'm blanking on the title, but um, Ann Nelson that, that dives into the sort of money behind the evangelical political power network, um, and I'm blanking on the title, but I could send it to you later if you want. Um, you know, I, I will say one thing I appreciate is that for, there was a lot of input and, you know, there were a lot of influences in, in my family growing up, but my parents were always skeptical of the prosperity gospel preachers. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I appreciate that, like, because, um, you know, I think they took that with a grain of salt. But 
Yeah, the money and politics stuff is fascinating, and, and I would just point to also Catherine Stewart, the power worshippers, I think gets into that a little bit. So those would be two, two writers I would look to. If I may take um, host um, prerogative for a second and ask my own question. Um, this is uh, personal for me. I am the mother of two uh, folks in the LGBTQ community. Um, their entire lives they have been kids of a preacher and so um, have grown up in the church and um, have embraced a little bit of that message of sharing Jesus with the folks around them in uh, uniquely Episcopal ways. Um, but one of the things that really gets under their skin is going toe-to-toe -to -toe theologically with evangelical classmates or uh, co-workers and um, they lead with Jesus loves me just as I am and I am. There's a couple of different categories that they fall into. Um, and I'm wondering, they have had evangelical friends who identify the same way and are struggling with wanting to stay in that community being told, well, we do love you, but. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about, about uh, LGBTQ folks in those spaces who love the community, love the worship, love the ladies with casseroles, um, but have this have to stay in the closet, yeah. so to speak. There's a whole I have a whole chapter about it, and it's so painful for a lot of people. Like one of my friends, um, Jeff Chu, who's a writer um, and a pastor, actually, he was just ordained a couple weeks ago. Um, writes talked to me about, and, and I and I tell this story in the book, but about. Um, you know, attending his seminary graduation and his husband sitting on one side and his parents sitting on the other because his parents won't be with his husband. And the really difficult, difficult compromises he's had to make to just have a relationship with them. And I thought what was so beautiful about that is how even through that pain, in, a, in what feels to me like almost a uniquely pastoral way, Jeff is extending that love back to people who, you know, he loves, but are unable to fully accept him. Um, and, and, you know, I talk about others as well. You know, and, and one other story I tell in the book is about my friends, uh, Kate and Andy Blair, uh, who grew up uh, in, a, in an evangelical denomination. Andy was a pastor. They started a small, small church in, in Savannah, Georgia, where I lived for a little bit, and um, basically wound up kind of being pushed out of their denomination when they decided to fully accept and recognize a lesbian couple in their congregation. Um, Kate performed their wedding ceremony and she, as she d did for every church member who got married, posted on Facebook celebrating it and that was the beginning of the end with that denomination. So for them that meant unfortunately having to break those those ties and you know, it, but the, and I, I, look, I we have religious freedom in this country. People have a right to believe things that we don't like and don't disagree with. Um, but I think what you see on sort of those individual relational levels is people um, taking sometimes really difficult stands or fighting really hard to be who they are and still be in relationship with people they love. And uh, you know how they navigate that is so individual. And um, but I you know I share some of those stories in the book, which I found really touching. I'd like to thank you all for your wonderful questions. Father Steve, I'm going to ask you to use a microphone. I'm sorry. For our live streamers, we love you. Of course. Thank you all for your questions. If you have further questions, uh, Sarah will be available to sign books at a table over in the next room. Um, so bring your book and ask your question after that. Please join me.